So this uh, right now is an invitation for for, for the people is here uh, listening this this program uh, to take the challenge, <laughs> because I think that that, that would be is, is the things that we can find in Galapagos could be for sure interesting for around the world. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a free weekly podcast featuring stories from the entrepreneurs and icons of commodities, capital markets, and technology, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we explore the question, is capitalism in crisis, and will building smarter markets be the antidote? Welcome back to Demystifying the Carbon Markets on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at Abex Technologies. Our guest today is Norman Ray, former president of the Governing Council of the Galapagos Islands. We'll be discussing promoting sustainable development, protecting biodiversity, and how carbon financing can play a part. Hello, Norman. Welcome to Smarter Markets. You know, many of us who have never been to the Galapagos Islands still feel a special attachment to them. They're both a living laboratory of biodiversity through evolution and a microcosm of what may be lost if we don't rise to the challenge of climate change, but they're also your home. And so the Galapagos Islands face both internal pressures for sustainable development, as well as many external threats. I wanted to talk first a little bit with you about some of the internal pressures and how they're being addressed, because the Galapagos have many lessons to share with the rest of us on conservation. Could you start us off today by telling us a little bit about, you know, some of the internal pressures for sustainable development that the islands are facing and your vision for the Galapagos over the next few decades? Thank you very much, David, for the opportunity to be with you and all the people that that are listening to the the podcast. Uh, First of all, uh, I want to uh, ask for forgiveness if my English is not so perfect. (laughs) Sorry about that. And, uh, but uh, I will try to do my best. Uh, well, Galapagos, uh, as, as, as you said, is an um, is incredible uh, a living lab for many things, for evolution, for sure, for conservation. But at the same time, uh, is a living lab to, to understand what are the, the, the impacts of, uh, of, of trying to find a balance between the life of people and the life of nature in a little place. We are, human beings are allowed to occupy the three or four percent of the territory for human activities. And also, uh, the, the, we have 97 percent of, 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 the, of the land is a national park. And we are surrounded by 135,000 square kilometers of a, a protected marine reserve. So it's really interesting uh, because one of the, of the biggest threats for, to the endemism in, of, of our species in Galapagos are invasive species that came uh, through all the transportations and uh, systems and all the, all the needs for, the, for tourism activity and the life of the people in the islands. We are close to 32,000 or 33,000 people living in Galapagos and pre-pandemia numbers of tourism in the in 2019, we have a number of visitors of 275,000 people that came in 2019. The pre-pandemic numbers. The one of the internal uh, big uh, another big threat in, in, in Galapagos is the, the less of urban planification we can say in a way or another uh, in the development of the towns, uh, the lack of services and the pressure of the impact of tourism in relation with, uh, with the life of the people in the towns and how the, the business of tourism uh, could generate more as a consequence of migration effects of people coming to Galapagos to work because the business before the pandemic was so good that is one of the, of the biggest attractions of people trying to live in Galapagos. So this is one of the conditions that I think that uh, could be uh, part of the threats that we have. At the same time, other 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 thing that maybe not all the time people is aware is that uh, living in Galapagos is expensive, and uh, 
meeting their natural heritage of the uh, for the people or led them the, to the community for the locals to uh, go and have the opportunity to to travel to the jewels of the crown of the islands could be a very expensive uh, uh, trip. We have to, be, we, uh, the locals that we live in Galapagos, we, we have to pay as a tourist to go and meet the other places of the island. And it means, for example, a uh, uh, one day trip uh, to, to, to go to Bartolomé, that's one of the incredible sites in, in, in Galapagos. You have to pay uh, not less than $240 per day, per person only. So you have a family of four, it's quite expensive to do it. And the result of that is that you, sometimes you can find like a disconnection, a gap between the, 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 the life of the people and their understanding of why are necessary the restrictions that you have for your life uh, in your economy or, or in your economic opportunities because uh, it's, it's difficult to understand why they're necessary because they don't, they don't have a strong connection what, what is the, 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 with the natural heritage of the islands. Because they don't know the, the, the natural heritage, they're not so linked because it's really complicated to them to, to, to visit the places and to get connected with, the, with nature. So this is really interesting because it, in the lack of that is public policy, but it, you need a lot of education also to support and how to connect more people that live there to their natural heritage to un, so they can understand and they can love also the place that they know. Because if they don't know what is the importance of the place where you're living, it's difficult to, 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 them, to get connected to them. So this is one of the examples of what we are suffering in, in, in Galapagos. Uh, and one of the, the bigger challenges that we have to face. Yeah, it's tourism, which I'm sure is such so foundational for the the economy there. You've brought up these many many challenges that it poses between inadvertently bringing in invasive species, and you know, really sadly, uh, you know, making it too expensive for the people that live there to really enjoy the natural heritage. Um, you know, I know that. In the Galapagos, there's been the creation of uh, a sustainability, innovation, and resilience hub. Um, I imagine the hub is being created in part to try to address some of these issues. Um, but can you tell us about the hub and more broadly, how do you see the role for these types of public-private sector cooperation in creating more sustainable development? Well, uh Two, a little more than three years ago, when, when I started my, my, my work uh, as the president of the Government Council of Galapagos, that, uh, by the way, is a special regime uh, to govern the islands under the, their weak and incredible circumstances uh, of, of nature. Uh, this special regime is, is, is different in the way other, other uh, provinces in Ecuador, uh, are, in the way they are governing and, 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 and administrated. It's quite different. It's, it's, like a, it's like a way to organize the, the work of the executive power with the work of the local governments inside the islands. You, you have uh, three majors of the three populated islands, one representative of the rural parish, and at the same time, you have uh, four ministers of the cabinet of the government, tourism, environment, and agriculture, and planning. And who is the president of the government council is designed by the president of Ecuador, and uh, has uh, is like and also is part as a minister of of, of, of their of their cabinet. This is the only way in Ecuador that you have these things. So it's really important to to know that also because it's is the complexity of 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 organizing the life in Galapagos. Uh, at the same time, the, the idea of uh, three years ago, I, I went to a really interesting meeting that was organized by, by two young uh, students, women uh, from Galapagos, that they were studying nanotechnology. <laughs> so it was hmm. really, really interesting that, yeah. So these two girls, 
uh, uh, where uh, right now they are already finishing their studies and, and one, one of them is, is right now in, in, in Germany, in Berlin, studying their master and planning to do he, her PhD in nanotechnology, exactly. And the, he, he, she came with, with a lot of the big heads of nanotechnology around the world to make like a, like a congress of nanotechnology in the islands. And it was really interesting because we were uh, two or not, two, not more than 10 Galapagueños sitting in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, in this room, hearing all these great minds talking about what is nanotechnology for the world. And it, this, this uh, meeting for me was like a, a great uh, uh, trigger to, huh. to, to see what are the, 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 the big question was, all right, we have two nanotechnology engineers, uh, young women of Galapagos, committed with their community. What do we have to do with that? So it comes, the, 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 this big word is called innovation. And innovation, as you know, is linked with many things. You can innovate in the economy, in social, in whatever. So it's a great opportunity. So, so we started to talk with two universities of the, of the UK. One of them is Cambridge uh, through King's College uh, and also with Edinburgh University and, uh, from Scotland. And also with two other universities in Ecuador. It's called uh, Universidad San Francisco de Quito that they have a campus from since 20 years ago in the islands. And also the, the biggest public university here in Ecuador is called Universidad Central del Ecuador. And we also were talking with Fundación Charles Darwin that they are making science for 60 years in the islands. Charles Darwin Foundation is the name of it. And also with the government council and at the same time with the National uh, Secretary of Science and Technology, it's called CENESIT in Spanish and also uh, with the Environmental uh, Investment Fund for Sustainability, that's called FIAS, that is closely linked to the fight against invasive species in the islands. And we, in uh, 2020, we decided to push the possibility to discuss sustainability and resilience with innovation in the islands as a consequence also of the learnings of the impact of COVID-19 in Galapagos. So we, people, the community and everybody started to think, okay, it's the first time that in Galapagos, all the economic activities stopped. No, mm -hmm. Just an example, in 2019, in July, we have 20,000 uh, tourists that came to the islands. And in July 2020, that we opened the, 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 again, the operation of tourists in Galapagos, after we control the contagions, the community contagions, and do a lot of, of, of measures to, to, to stop that, uh, they, they came 48 tourists to Galapagos. See the difference, the gap? 48. 48. <laughs> so, and, so it was really a, a tough situation, and we are still not recovering the numbers that we used to have uh, before the pandemic. So the impact in the economy, tourism means more than 80% of the economy of the islands. Then come public sector. And uh, uh, people suffer a lot. Uh, and Galapagos uh, learned to develop really interesting solidarity processes uh, to uh, secure food security for the people that is, were living there. And uh, also, uh, we, we have to do a lot of, uh, of public policy and also find a way of working with the private and the public in a solidarity way to find the solutions and to save the life of the people and give them the opportunity to, and, and at the same time, protecting, uh, uh, generating the protection of the destiny. Uh, because we, we were aware that, when, that if, if the impact of the life of the people that was the most important thing in that moment. Uh, we, we're not a priority in that, in, in, in that moment. The, the results in the future of the destiny could be the, uh, a disaster for the future of the activity in Galapagos, for the tourist activity in Galapagos. So we also, we, we, we do a lot of things and, and, and uh, 
then opening this opportunity to think, okay, we have to work in water, energy, food, no, uh, education, uh, and see how we can uh, link all these things uh, to develop knowledge for the islands, but also knowledge for other island states around the world. We believe that the things that we can do in Galapagos could have a great impact in other places around the world and could be a really living lab reference, important reference to, to do all the things in the worldwide. Because as we are human beings living inside a natural heritage, inside an, uh, 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 a national park, and we uh, learn and, and we have developed knowledge uh, around living with restrictions. And climate change is going to be a great restriction for, the, for, for human beings around the world. So this, I think that is a great opportunity to... So we, we, we thought that this is a great opportunity to start to, uh, uh, to make Galapagos a place where we, we can sit together with others you know, around the world to find the solutions that we were searching in the planet. And it's fascinating because so many of us over the past few years of the pandemic have, you know, had the life we were accustomed to taken away and it's led many people to reevaluate uh, how they're living. And it sounds like for the Galapagos, it's also allowed for a, a reevaluation of the extent of the reliance on tourism and looking for new ways to develop the economy and create, um, I imagine, jobs and, and a way of life. And as you put it, living with restrictions. So that's, that's, that's fascinating to me. And of course, uh, living with restrictions is likely going to apply to many of us in terms of trying to deal with some of the pressures that we're all facing globally with climate change. <clears throat> and, you know, I wanted to get into that a little bit with you. And, you know, obviously the Galapagos, you know, are one of the more vulnerable regions to these types of external threats when we think about you know, islands amongst the time of rising sea levels, you know, increasing plastic waste in the oceans, uh, invasive species, as you mentioned earlier. You know, mm -hmm. when you look, um, often for those of us who, who aren't living in areas that are as vulnerable, the impacts of climate change can feel uh, like maybe something in the future. You know, they don't feel as tangible. Are you experiencing effects of climate change and other you know, environmental changes now? And, you know, if you are, can you share some of those? Mm -hmm. For example, the, 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 the increase of sea level is not so uh, clear uh, right now in, in Galapagos. We are not uh, suffering that kind of impact. But we know that because we, we, we had in the, in the past, in 1982 and also in 1998, uh, I guess, uh, the impact of uh, Fenomeno del Niño. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and we, we learned a lot about what, what could happen if El Niño came again to Galapagos uh, in the impact that we can have in the, in, the, in the marine life and also in the life in the land. Uh, what, we, what we knew in that moment is that uh, all the food ecosystem for the biodiversity in the islands could be incredible damage in the sea. Uh, right now, we, Galapagos is, is really interesting because Galapagos has a, some special conditions. We, we have uh, four marine currents, really important, and one of them is Humboldt Current that came from the south of South America and in front of the coasts of Peru and Ecuador, they turn left to the west <laughs> and then uh, and then get into the to Galapagos and you have another current that came from the, the, from the South Pacific and other uh, but it generates a we have a hot warm warm and cold currents but uh, this this balance generated an incredible uh, well-being situation for the life in the oceans and also in the islands. And as the, at the same time that we have a protected marine reserve of 135 square kilometers, 
where it is not allowed the industrial, the fishery industrial activity, uh, only a small scale fishery, it means that the Galapagos is like a nursery of life in the in the in the Eastern Pacific, and um, that's one of the reasons because it's so incredible uh, place to 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 see marine life and also the life on the land, and it's also the reasons because you can. Uh, and I, I was reading something about it, and 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 I found that in a, in the other parts of the equatorial line that passes in the north part of uh, of Isabela, that's one of is the biggest island in 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 the Galapagos. The equatorial line passes through uh, Galapagos also. Uh, in the other parts of the world. The equatorial in, in the in the tropics and in the island ecosystem and in the sea are, are suffering of the impact of climate change uh, uh, in the seas in the oceans. The species are going to the poles, trying to 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 feel more cold water and to have more uh, better weather uh, conditions. But they're still coming back to Galapagos. So it's really interesting what's going on. But at the same time, we know that we are incredibly vulnerable for climate impacts and, and, and uh, uh, if, if they change the, the temperature of the water. Right now, uh, conditions are uh, not uh, getting so uh, hot and we are not having a strong uh, uh, winters yet. But we know that if we are going to have extreme uh, climate conditions as Fenomeno del Niño or Fenomeno de la Niña, the impact in the life of, the, of our nature uh, and our biodiversity and our fauna and vegetables is going to be a, a huge impact. Because in, the, in La Niña, a lot of uh, uh, iguanas, marinas, marine iguana, there is a... a uh, really important for all other ecosystem and also sea, uh, sea wolves and uh, other uh, marine birds and uh, all the ecosystem uh, uh, trophic uh, um, uh, I don't know how to say in English this word uh, trophic uh, cadena chain, trophic chain maybe it's the, it's the name, Cadena Trofica, could be uh, damaged by the impact of, 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 uh, of climate change. So we are incredibly vulnerable for that. And at the same time, as a consequence of that, invasive species, that one that is the biggest threat for endemism, could generate, could have that incredible opportunity to spread in a more aggressive way in the land and also in the sea. Uh, so these are the conditions that we, we we can suffer when 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 these extreme climate conditions could happen in in Galapagos, and at the same time, because we are a kind of a nursery of ocean life in in, in the eastern Pacific, we also suffer a lot of pressure of fishery industry in the limits of our economic exclusive zone that is 182 miles from the limit of the protected marine reserve of Galapagos. So, um, we, uh, as, as I told you, Galapagos is a nursery of life uh, for, for, the, for, for a lot of, of uh, uh, f uh, marine fauna, but the pressure of, the, of, big, of big international fleets in the limits of the, our marine exclusive zone, even the Ecuadorian, even the Chinese, and even other fleets, is also is going to be bigger and bigger because if, if, if we are still going to have better weather conditions than other parts around the equatorial line and the tropics as a result of our marine currents, it, it means that uh, or you go to fish on the poles or you go to Galapagos <laughs> to find tuna, for example, just for an example, no? And that is one of the, of the big, other big threat that we, well, well, we have. And this is because uh, we need to, to push more, more sustainable management 
inside the economic exclusive some Galapagos and outside of them in international waters. It's amazing. So sounds like the the greatest threats right now are to the biodiversity, <clears throat> and some are subtle, or would seem subtle in terms of the changing of the the temperatures of the currents and migratory fish needing to move closer to the poles to stay cool. But also, it, it's fascinating, right, where you have an area that is doing well then becomes encroached upon. Uh, you know, as as we look for for grounds to go fishing, as other areas become uh, you know less less productive. And I know at, at the COP twenty six meeting in Glasgow last year, the the governments in the region announced an extension of the marine reserve to protect some of that species, protect from the overfishing, and you know kind of increase the boundaries. And it sounds like this is a, a very important initiative. Um, but when I heard about that, I, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, when you think about these large international meetings like the COPs, um, what is it like for smaller countries like Ecuador that are bearing, you know, a, a disproportionate burden of climate change, uh, being in international negotiations like COP26 that are seemingly dominated by larger countries, you know, like the U.S. and China, that have benefited far more from the economic growth uh, you know, that's come with a lot of these environmental impacts. Well, always Ecuador uh, historically has the, the, the thesis, and, and because I, I believe that it's true, that we have different responsibilities uh, that we have to face uh, against climate change. Uh, and... Um, in the case of Galapagos, uh, as, as I told you, the big pressure over the, the, as a result of these incredible conditions that we have, uh, the message that Ecuador was trying to, to, to put on the, on the international discussion is that even this little country wants to generate a sustainable management of their resources in the economic exclusive zone. This is a, is a concept that you know, there's this, this is a ocean, or the the there is a sea international agreement. Uh, uh, it's called Convemar. It's the convention of the seas uh, of, of United Nations, and in this convention, that more than 160 countries signed it. China also signed that that convention. I, I think that the United States not, but China yes, and a lot of other countries around the world. They have this concept of economic exclusive zone in the in the sea, and the economic exclusive zone is a, is, is 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 not a, the same concept of uh, territorial waters, no. That it was the old concept. It means a place that you can develop your uh, economic activities and also allow uh, allow to other uh, if you want to to other fleets to do the same to other countries. But in practice. It is like a international waters under the jurisdiction of the national country. No? It's, it's, I don't know if, if, you, if you can understand it. It's, it's no one land, could be a no one land in, in the ocean. And, right. and, and for, for the national fleets, you know. <laughs> so they say that they have the opportunity to have like a... a and, and this is one of the greatest discussion with a, with a, with a national industry around this stuff. They say, okay, our comparative uh, conditions to deal with, uh, with other uh, industries, uh, fishery industries around the world, is that we have economic exclusive some 100 kilometers from our national coast. So our energy effort does not have to be so uh, hard as other fleets that travel around the world. Even the Ecuadorian fleet travel around the world, the tuna fleet. No? Mm. It's one of the biggest in the Pacific, in the, in the Eastern Pacific. But uh, um, they say that if, if, if we create another marine reserve in the, in, in, in the area, that could harm their economic opportunities in relation to the other ones. But at the end, through a dialogue process, not easy uh, process, but at the end, they understand that this could also is a way to to manage in a better way the, our resources because there's data of the incredible impact 
good impact of the marine reserve of Galapagos that was declared in 1998, because the, the Galapagos was declared part of the UNESCO Natural Heritage in 1978. But the marine reserve, protect, protected marine reserve, were declared in 1998. And they know, because that about of the positive impact, even for the commercial uh, species for the fishery that the marine reserve has in all the eastern and tropical Pacific seascape. So, uh, but they were aware of that. Uh, and at the end, they understand the importance of, 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 of making these measures. And, and I think that the big, the big step of the, of the current government is to say, because we, we have been working on this uh, since the, the former government too, but this government decided and say, okay, let's go with this and let's send this message of, first, we can uh, generate a dialogue process with the industry. And at the same time, we send a, a message of uh, the necessity of having sustainable management in, in the economic exclusive zone. So what happened is that there's an, a no long line, a 30,000 square kilometers of no long line activity, and also a, a 30,000 area of no take uh, zone, 30,000 square kilometers of no take zone in the economic exclusive zone. And the idea is to, that this area could be connected also with a migratory way that connects with Costa Rica Isla de Cocos, and, and also with Colombia and Panama with their, with their own ecosystems. So we can prevent uh, a way of protection for the migratory species in this corridor. So this is the big, the, the, the big dream. The presidents of Colombia, Costa Rica, Panama, and Ecuador, they say that they they going to, to generate like a biosphere, biosphere um, a protected area under the regulation, international regulation of UNESCO of this corridor. As it is, and this was a consequence of the declaration of Ecuador of generating this, this, this uh, protected area uh, linked to Galapagos is a new area that can be the opportunity to discuss uh, this connection of protection in the oceans under the objectives of the 2030, 30% uh, 30 of, of uh, of protection of oceans until 2030. So this, I think that was an amazing decision. A lot of things to do yet. Everybody will like to, to, to get a better protection, but it's really interesting what happened uh, in, in the way of, of, of uh, open a precedent that we need to have sustainable management in a economic exclusive zone. And this is not an easy, easy issue because uh, fishery industry around the world has a lot of opposition of having sustainability management in their economic exclusive zones, even or for, for sure in the uh, international waters. Uh, certainly to get numerous countries to agree on areas where they would normally be competing with each other to get industry to agree with government when, you know, to some extent government is telling industry, well, you can't fish here to be able to, for them to see the overall benefit, even to them, uh, of having a more protected reserve. Um, it's a great accomplishment. And it sounds like as well, you know, what was the reception of it when this was announced at COP26? Well, I heard to the environmental ministry of, uh, of uh, the UK, uh, his name is uh, Zach Goldsmith, and uh, he said that, uh, and, and many other leaders, and all the, uh, for example, I heard from uh, Donna Bertarelli, that is one of the... Uh, especially uh, United Nations ambassador for the protection of the oceans and Sylvia Earle and, and, and a lot of people that were uh, aware of this kind of, of, of declaration that the COP of Glasgow, uh, the, one of the, of the big moments of the COP of Glasgow was, was this decision of, of Ecuador and the decision of, of, of the other countries to, to go to the 
biosphere protection in, in, in the area of the, of the marine corridor of the eastern and tropical Pacific seascape. So for me, as a citizen of the world, maybe, <laughs> and of Ecuador, uh, and, and it was, was an incredible decision uh, because it has the impact in Glasgow and at the same time has a really interesting impact here in Ecuador and also in Galapagos because in 2017, this is really important to remember, a mm -hmm. uh, ship, a big cargo ship, Chinese ship, called the Fuyang Yuli, was captured inside the marine reserve of Galapagos. There's no possibility to, 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 to have a industrial, national or international uh, industrial activity inside the, the marine reserve. All the people know that around the world is in the maps, and they know that there are incredible sanctions for it. I don't know what happened, but they found this. It, it, it was not a fishery uh, vessel was a cargo vessel, uh, a big refrigerator vessel, if we can say it in a way or another. Yeah. More than 6,000 uh, species of, uh, were there, 6,000 sharks inside the vessel. And some of them, like less than two, I think so, no, uh, uh, were uh, uh, whale sharks. So this was an incredible impact. And Ecuador developed a really important trial uh, against the, the owners of the ship. Uh, China says that this was a decision, it's not a decision of, of, of the country. The responsibility is from the owners of the companies of the vessels, that they respect Galapagos limits and they understand the biodiversity and the role that Galapagos has in the oceans and all this uh, position and but in that moment the community of Galapagos said that it's important to increase the protection of the seas in the islands because we are facing a lot of threats and then I link it with another uh, problem that we have is rubbish and plastic rubbish that came to Galapagos and most of the of the of the rubbish that came to Galapagos comes through the marine currents and comes from the continent. Mm. No? <laughs> it says that maybe close to fifty percent of it. But at the same time you find a lot of bottles with trademarks that came from Asia. But the rubbish of these bottles by currents ends in Hawaii. It's proved. So what's going on? is the also the impact of the way in international waters that international fleets manage their own rubbish and, and, uh, in, 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 in the seas. And at the end, it stopped in Galapagos. A lot of efforts of the community also to prevent uh, coast marine cleaning processes, a lot of things going on around it. But plastic is another of the big threats that we face in the external fled, uh, impacts in the island. So it's really interesting how everything at the end is kind of linked. No? <laughs> so that's really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. It's all connected. It all finds its way yeah, to you it's connected. Uh, for it's good and for ill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you know, on this series, we've talked a lot about carbon markets and um, you know, looking for ways in which they can help the world move towards net zero carbon emissions and limit the climate change that's creating some of the external pressures on the Galapagos. Um, and to the extent that the, the, the rest of the world can uh, handle its trash better, handle its carbon emissions better, that will certainly make uh, the efforts that, that, that uh, the Galapagos uh, are undertaking um, you know, much more successful. But is there a more direct role for the private funding and investment that um, you know carbon markets or environmental markets can provide? Uh, is there a more direct role for that type of funding and investment in the Galapagos? Yes, for sure. And um, uh, I think that it will be really interesting to find uh, links between the, for example, uh, the 
the protection of, of, of native uh, vegetation in the islands. Our, there's a, a really uh, not so well-known uh, tree <laughs> and that is called Escalesia in the islands. And is uh, uh, that have been having a lot of impact uh, uh, because invasive species like uh, the uh, it's called let me blackberry 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 is an invasive species that came to 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 Galapagos many years ago and is one of the biggest threats against escalesia and escalesia is really important for the life of turtles the, to 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 keep the protection of water and to generate all the ecosystem conditions for the life in the islands. Uh, and uh, I think that it will be really interesting to find a way to, to restore, and there are really, uh, really interesting uh, uh, processes uh, that have been leading by the National Park and also linked with, with a project with other organizations as Charles Darwin Foundation, then trying to see how to push a recover of this uh, 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 own vegetation that is a strategy, uh, strategic for the life in the islands. So there's an incredible possibility to link the, the, the carbon markets with, with, with Galapagos directly. Also in, in, in blue carbon initiatives, uh, uh, for example, for, uh, for uh, mangroves is really important and also for the protection of all the wetlands that we have in other the islands, in Isabela, for example, and also in, in, in San Cristobal. Uh, there are four, four populated islands. The biggest is Santa Cruz, the other one is San Cristobal, and there comes Isabela, and there comes Floriana. And each of them have different ecosystems. No? For example, San Cristobal is the only island that has a lot of, uh, of uh, drinking water. No, it's the, uh, the other ones have uh, the majority of water is salty water, <laughs> no, so, and, and and you have to invest a lot of efforts to 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 transform the water uh, for the well consumption of of human beings in the islands. Uh, also for agriculture, that is really important because right now we depend on seventy percent of import foods and goods from the from outside, and it means a risk for invasive species too. So we have to develop a lot of resources in uh, quarantine processes and control. Uh, the state of Ecuador do a lot of that to, to, to prevent the, the, that invasive species get into, into the islands. But historically, they already came and they're already still there. Even that we are doing a lot of things of eradicating and in some cases aggressive processes against goats in the 90s, for example, that was part of the history of the world. People going to hunting God, uh, goats because there were plenty of them and they also was a, a threat to the life of the islands. But uh, you can, right now there's an incredible uh, fight against, for example, a, a mosquito, it's called feloni, it's a fly, the, la mosca feloni. Uh, because they put their eggs inside the nets of the birds. So it's a big issue. And there's a lot of research on that. What I'm trying to see is that science is, uh, is important around the world. And for Galapagos, it's a key issue. And we, we can find a way to generate carbon markets investment linked with, with science research against the threats that, that uh, the endemism of the islands is suffering. If we can find a way to push a better recover from mangroves, the protection of wetlands, and also of, of, of Asian vegetation in the islands, we can find interesting ways of linking the, the, the carbon markets with activity in, in, in Galapagos. And even we have to be innovative and to innovate how to link all these efforts also with the protection of the oceans uh, against illegal fishery and the pressure of, of, of fishery in, in, in the oceans of, uh, around Galapagos and, all, and, and also in education of the people. And then we can uh, uh, find really interesting connections, for example, with energy and also with water. 
uh, Ener Galapagos right now is using not more than 20% of solar and eolic energy. The other, the other part of it is uh, uh, oil energy, uh, thermoelectric energy, with, I don't know, it's with diesel. So I remember, I remember that when I was the, the president of government council, that one of my first decisions of public policy in Santa Cruz is to stop the importation of electric cars because there wasn't a local production of uh, solar energy for the batteries. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they were uh, connecting in the night to the diesel uh, uh, infrastructure and we were paying electric cars with diesel. <laughs> we are charging <laughs> batteries with that, so it was a mess. So I say, no way, until we develop the, the capacity to generate our solar uh, home base it, or a big plan of it, it is, is, is a weird thing to keep doing these things because it's absolutely contradictory. And this is the big impact. Also, if we can find the connection between the, 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 biggest, the biggest consumption of oil in the islands, of diesel in the islands, is for the transportation of tourism and transportation of people in, in Galapagos. It means sea activity. So there's a lot of things to do in the research and, in the, and to link. If there's a, a way to connect research of carbon markets, no, link it with solutions for these uh, so sensitive places where you can innovate research and to see how it can work for the solution of transportation and mobility in a, in a, in a better clean way. That will be really interesting challenges to find the way to, to do it. Oh, uh, we are going to have a big project of solar energy in Galapagos, 20 hectares of solar panels uh, in, in, in the island of Baltra that is close to Santa Cruz, where's the airport. This is going to change the relation between uh, uh, solar energy and diesel energy. But at the same time, it's important to say that the way people uh, build their houses and infrastructure in Galapagos is pushing and is an increasing needs of energy of, of power of 7% each year. So we need to change that also. <laughs> so any, any carbon market solution for Galapagos have to get connected necessary, necessary with research and to find concrete solutions also to the development of better infrastructure with less impact in the increase of needs of energy and power in the islands and changing the matrix right now of, of how we work. So I think that this, the, 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 the innovation challenge is there because uh, if, if, if we don't do it, that will be really uh, complex uh, for the future because each, each time that we need more space for put more solar panels, we affect the national park limits, no? <laughs> because we don't have enough space to, 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 to do things there. This is one of the reasons because it's a great challenge to, to, to do okay. While we can develop understanding that we live in a place with restrictions, human beings inside a natural heritage and a national park. Okay. So this uh, right now is an invitation for, for, for the people is here uh, listening to this, this program uh, to take the challenge. <laughs> because I think that, that, that would be is, is the things that we can find in Galapagos could be for sure interesting for around the world. Thanks again to Norman Ray, former president of the Governing Council of the Galapagos Islands. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week when we'll continue to explore the carbon supply chain moving on to the role of the intermediaries and end users of carbon markets. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets. For free episode transcripts, visit smartermarketspod.com. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. 
The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Smarter Markets, its producers, sponsors and hosts, Eric Townsend and Abex Technologies, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets.